Hello and welcome to From the Woods Today. I'm Renee Williams and I'm here with my co-host Billy Thomas and we both work in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources and we have a great show lined up for you today. Yeah, looking forward to it, Renee. Um, as always, we're trying to bring you all some timely information about what's going on here with forestry and wildlife issues here in the state of Kentucky. And um, we're so glad to have you all with us, whether you're viewing via Zoom or via live on Facebook. Um, thank you all for being part of the show. Um, as a reminder, you can interact with us via the chat pod. Um, and if you're in Zoom, you can use that. And if you're on Facebook, you can use the comment section there. We will respond to those as quickly as we can. But again, we're just delighted to have you all with us. And I'm excited about our presenters as well, Renee. Definitely. Well, first off, we've got Dr. Matt Springer. He's going to do some food plot maintenance for us. So Matt, do you want to get on with us for just a second and kind of explain what your topic is going to be about today? Sure. This is the last segment of our food plot series. So we're going to cover a little bit more of, uh, so you got something planted, hopefully it's growing. Uh, what do you then do to make sure you have success? So we're going to cover maintenance, mostly weed control uh, with that. And then also, how do you then figure out if you had a successful plot and, you know, do you need to change things? All right. Sounds good. Good morning. This is Dr. Matt Springer here with our third segment of our food plot series. Uh, in this segment, we're going to cover maintaining the food plot once it's now been planted and established and also looking at how do you measure success of your planting. Now, unfortunately, because our food plot just went in a couple weeks ago, we're going to have to go more to the traditional webinar scenario instead of having an actual video of doing these things. It's just timing didn't work out. We can't, if we were four or five months out from when we planted, we'd be able to do that and collect video and show you hands on. Unfortunately, it's just not the way it um, has kind of set in place for us here. So we're going to use the traditional PowerPoint uh, slides to kind of walk you through what you need to do. So a lot of what your uh, actions are going to be after now that you have things planted is really uh, more thinking about how do I uh, act like a traditional farmer and control the weeds that are growing in my plot uh, and also how do you then figure out you know is everything I did up to this point actually going to be successful in terms of attracting wildlife uh, to the area. Uh, so let's cover the weeds part and you know really they're going to be an issue um, especially with new plots, because uh, you just went in, eliminate all the competition, release that seed bed, put your own seeds in there, but you have what's in there uh, already in that spot going to be as co competition for uh, what you planted. So you have to go through the process of checking on your plot fairly frequently uh, as it's uh, growing uh, and maturing. And when you spot something that doesn't look right, identify what weed you have there and then choose that uh, appropriate uh, herbicide to to eliminate it uh, from your area. Now, an example of a common food plot weed here, this is smart weed. It's got pink flowers. Uh, and it's one that actually we wanna promote if we're doing a waterfowl plot, but when we have it in an upland situation, uh, especially during wet years, we wanna get in there and remove it because it can really um, become quite dense and, and shade out every everything in there uh, that you have planted. So when we look at what herbicides you may want to become familiar with that are, are used commonly in food plots, uh, we're going to start with the one that we use to actually clean the area out and, and kill all the competition, and that's glyphosate. Um, this can come in a couple different uh, more uh, commercial terms like uh, Roundup, uh, but this is a, a basically a nonspecific um, killer of plants. It's going to, anything it, it comes in contact with, it's going to have an impact on. Now we can get into some more specific ones that act on certain types of plants. Uh, so you want to be aware of those. And the next one there is uh, for broadleaf plants, which you're going to have a wide assortment of broadleaf weeds that pop up in your plot. Um, and the good thing here is you have a couple options. You have the generic uh, straight and broad um, treatment that we use is 2,4-D. Um, and this is, you know, here's an example of one of the um, ways it's named for purchase uh, in the picture. But you also have what's called 2,4-DB, which is a little bit more specific on how it acts. And it actually gives you a little bit of leeway in using it in your plot uh, because it won't um, if impact your clover, your alfalfa, and some of your legumes that you have planted. Uh, however, it will definitely impact any brassicas or chicory you have in the plot. Um, so be aware of this as a potential tool. 
Then you also have, when you have grasses that pop up, uh, you have two different options. Um, the common ways you'll see them are either as post or vantage, uh, or also uh, rest uh, max uh, is the other um, company name that you'll see uh, on the store. And what these really do is allows you to, to um, treat any grasses that pop in a broad uh, spraying fashion, uh, especially useful in places like clover plots as you see in the picture. Other things you may encounter outside of weeds, um, we have, you know, wildlife pests can be something. You, you may have put a, a food plot in for one type of wildlife, but when you're putting food out in the landscape, there's gonna be other animals that use it. So things like raccoons and groundhogs are concerned. Uh, a groundhog can easily wipe out an entire eighth of an acre of soybeans, uh, if not taken care of on the front end, either through trapping uh, or removal with a firearm. And sometimes even the animals that we're trying to attract can be a pest. Uh, based on how quickly they browse down the plot that's present. You know, and, and the scenario that usually comes up is uh, soybeans. The first six weeks that they come out of the ground, they're highly attracted to deer. And if deer continuously browse them down and don't let them grow further and larger um, to pass the point where they can take that browsing, you're going to basically have no food plot left by the time uh, hunting season rolls around. So you may have to invest in a temporary electric fence to try to keep them out there uh, next weeks or so. Finally, some other maintenance activities include things like mowing, which is a common practice for clover uh, fields. Uh, it was believed that you should mow your clover field two or three times a year to promote new vegetative growth and, and increase that nutritional quality. Uh, recent work by uh, Craig Harper down at Tennessee has actually showed that that's not really uh, a necessity. Uh, so you can either go in and mow it, it can't hurt it, uh, promote a thick stand. However, it's if it's a time-consuming or arduous task or, or one where you don't want to disturb the animals, you don't have to worry about getting in there and doing that. Now, how do you determine if this was successful or not? Well, you want to monitor those plots, and the easiest way to do that is through using exclosures, which let you know how much vegetation is actually growing in the plot without being eaten, and also it lets you know how much is actually being eaten outside the plot. So you get this nice uh, comparison. Then there's also using trail cameras and where you want to pair, you really want to pair that with those exclosures to get an idea of how many animals are using the field, um, number of mouse con consistently on that ground and how much vegetation is then disappearing. So if you may have a lot of animals using the plot and the exclosure is not showing much of a difference, but your soil is so good that the vegetation is keeping up with that pressure. So it, it allows you to gauge what's really going on in terms of the amount of pressure versus your vegetation uh, quality. Finally, when we look go come to the end of the year, we try to reflect on what we've done and, and determine if what we have, all this effort that we put in is a success or not, and do we need to change things in the next growing season? There's a couple things you need to keep in mind. First and foremost, if this is a new plot, then you really need to think like, you know, not really judging success for the first two or three years, because it does take animals time to figure out that there's a food source there. Uh, a lot of our animals that use these areas are older and therefore they know where food should be. Uh, so they're not necessarily always looking for new places to find food. Uh, you know, their nose can lead them in, in to places where, you know, they shouldn't be like in this picture or this animal ends up in the garage, um, but it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to find your new plot immediately upon being planted. So don't make any drastic changes to these new areas uh, for at least two to three years to give the animals enough time to actually know that's an area that there's going to be food consistently. Secondly, um, climate conditions that are naturally occurring in the landscape can drastically impact how much your animals uh, in the area use your food plot. If it's a really good mass year and there's acorns everywhere, you're, you could plant the best food plot you've ever planted in your life and it will fail to that acorn food source every time. It's just that's how good they are and that's why we constantly talk about how important oaks are for wildlife. The other thing is if it's the drought year or incredibly wet year, those aren't great. Um, times to judge whether or not your food plot is a success. Your stand may not have been as good. The quality of the stand may not have been as good. Maybe you just ended up with a dirt field. Don't make any drastic changes in years that occur. And finally, I want to recommend, um, you know, if you want to continue doing food plots, I really recommend Dr. Craig Harper's University of Tennessee's book on 
wildlife food plots and early successional plants. It's basically the Bible for doing this kind of work in wildlife. Uh, he goes into great deal to detail on um, strategies also for individual uh, species or groups of species, uh, as well as the back like 200 pages of this book are individual weeds. Um, and it, it goes into, you know, uh, what, what is the name of the weed? How do you identify it? It does it have a wildlife value? If so, for what? And then how do you treat it and when you should treat it? Uh, to to get rid of it. It's an awesome resource. I, I tend to open this book up at least once a month. Um, so it's well worth the price if you're going to be doing food plots year in, year out. And finally, uh, you know, I'm always here as a resource. Anyone that has questions or needs to bounce ideas, the best way to reach me is through my email. But I, I um, hope you don't have to reach out to me because that means you're probably doing everything right. But I know that doesn't happen. So uh, if you run into a problem, please don't hesitate to reach out to, to myself or anyone in our forestry extension team. Uh, doesn't have to necessarily be a food plot question. That series is really nice that you've done there. You know, I, I know talking to woodland owners across the state all the time, that's something of interest to them. But now that you've got these nice three segments talking about it, I think it'll be a great resource for years to come. So really appreciate your effort in that. Yeah, I we do greatly appreciate that. Yeah, I hope it can be of value to folks out there. And, you know, obviously it's not a whole lot of time to get into the details, but it at least kind of frames things so you can know where to go out and find some more resources and more information to, to try to progress uh, through uh, the activity if you so decide. So just remember folks, if you have a question to go ahead and type them in the chat pod and we'll get them to Matt. Um, Matt, one thing I was wondering is, um, I know you ha you show a lot of pictures of, you know, deer eating and that kind of stuff. And I'm assuming there's some kind of cameras you have out there, but how wide an angle and how, for how many do you have to have for your food plots to be able to see those and that kind of thing? Well, so um, the trail cameras, there's a lot of different types out there and, and costs ranging from relatively cheap now, which traditionally they weren't that cheap, uh, was a limiting factor, but now you can get them in a store for like 40 bucks. Hmm. Uh, all the way up to like nine hundred thousand dollars a camera. Wow! <laughs> features you want. Um, the good thing is the cheap ones. You know, for the purposes that you need for a food plot, get get you what you need. Um, they uh, generally are able to take a decent picture out to about sixty feet in front of the camera. Um, so, you know, if you have a small food plot, acre or less, you really only need one camera. Now, if you have a bigger area, five, six, seven plus acres, you may want a couple cameras to try to cover you know, activity zones and really get an understanding of what's going on. Okay. And uh, Greg wants to know, how do you determine when it's a time to kill and replant? Well, that, that all depends on what you're growing. Um, you know, and a lot of times you'll, um, when you pick a type of, of seed, um, you're going to want to look at what that life cycle is, uh, understanding that, you know, uh, certain things have value after they've completed their cycle of growth. You know, like soybeans are a great example of that, where um, having soybeans out, you know, you plant them in May. Uh, most of our farmers that are doing this for commercial reasons are taking them down in October and November, but that resource is actually, uh, if it's still in the field for wildlife, super valuable in January and February if we have snow uh, because of the protein content, um, it's in those beans so they may look like they're dead and they are but those seeds are still there and valuable for you for wildlife and they do provide a structure uh, of cover to some level so um, a lot of times you don't necessarily need to get rid of what you plan in um, if it's an annual until it's about time to plant again mm. if it's a perennial then it, you kind of have to look at how well is that stand doing is it getting some infiltration from weeds that you can't really overcome with just spot treatment uh, and if you get overrun, then it's time to start things over again. Um, usually clover fields will, are one that's a perennial that'll last about five-ish years if you get a good stand. Uh, and then you want to start things up again and, and refresh it and, and, you know, hit the reset button. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have today, but I'm, I'm assuming that if someone has another question, they'll pop it in and we can ask you later on if you'll be staying throughout the show. I will be around. All right, great. Awesome, yeah. Good deal. All right, so next up we have Dr. Laura DeWall. Um, Laura is going to be talking about collecting acorns. And we've had Laura on here recently talking about tree nursery and their tree improvement program. But, you know, one of the things that she does work on is helping people collect acorns. And, um, and Laura, glad to have you with us today. Thanks. I'll go ahead and pull this up here. 
So the White Oak Genetics and Tree Improvement Program needs your help. Specifically, um, we need volunteers to help collect white oak acorns. And for those of you that don't know about the White Oak Genetics and Tree Improvement Program, it was started at the University of, Kent um, University of Kentucky with um, some funding with the Forest Service and the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And basically it's a collaboration among forest industries, agencies and organizations with the goals of quantifying um, genetic variation in white oak and also to improve traits that could have um, economic or ecological value into the forest. And assuming we're successful in getting all this done, what will happen is we'll be able to provide a sustainable supply of high quality white oak seedlings to meet both current and future demands. And this will improve our ability to conserve and restore white oak in the forests to achieve a variety of ecological conservation and economic goals. So to get all this started, we need white oak acorns from the entire geographic range, which is that green shaded area there on the map. So it's a huge area, which means I need a huge, a lot of help. So our goal is actually to try to get an acorn collection from one or two trees per county, per state, where white oak grows. So um, there's no way I can do it by myself, um, but fortunately, it's a really fun activity. Anyone can do it. Um, last year, the county extension um, programs in a variety of states helped me out. Um, the Master Naturalist programs um, in Virginia, Missouri, and Tennessee did a really great job helping me out. Um, I also had state and uh, federal um, personnel helping and citizen scientists and just people that had looked at our website and said, oh, I want to collect acorns. Um, I will collect all, I will accept all and any collections that folks make. And so um, I don't necessarily need you to collect acorns, but you're welcome to, of course, but especially spread the word. You know, if you have family and friends and colleagues in Kentucky or other states, you know, because I need that whole green shaded area, um, spread the word. And um, I want to note it is a kid friendly activity and these days um, it's easy to social distance to actually do this activity. It's very easy. All you need to do is go out and whoops, click, click the wrong button there. Sorry. There we go. All right. Um, just go out and find a white oak tree that has acorns on it. And Dr. Ellen Crocker last week talked about tree snap in the From the Woods Today show. And so you'll want to um, enter the tree in tree snap and take a picture. Then you just wait for those acorns to drop and hopefully um, the wildlife won't consider it a food plot because <laughs> you're gonna be competing with the wildlife for those acorns. But you're gonna just pick them up off the ground. And then what you need to do is actually put them in a glass of water, or a little bowl, and if they sink, they are good to go. And those are the ones that you want to save. The ones that float there on the top of that little jar, though, those won't germinate and grow into seedlings. So you scoop those off and you toss them away. And then you just keep going until you have about um, a one gallon Ziploc type bag full of acorns. And when that happens, you send me an email or call me and I will send you the postage for a priority mail um, box that you can then just put the acorns in that box and it'll have the, um, so I'll send you the postage. I'll send you a return address label to get those acorns to me um, at the University of Kentucky. And then once I get them, um, we'll be taking them out to the Kentucky Division of Forestry Nursery, um, which was also highlighted last week in our From the Woods Today show. And we'll get them planted um, in the nursery there and they will grow for a year. And then depending on how well they do, they will move to the next phase um, in our tree improvement program. So if you remember from, la if you joined us last week, you remember I talked about the germination rate is very low. And so, I need a lot of acorns and I need a lot of collections. Um, it is okay if I have more than two trees per county that have acorns collected from them. Um, you know, what we do is we just, we pick the best that comes up in the, the nursery. 
So if you are interested in doing this, um, please just fire me off an email. I have a flyer that I can send you that has the specific instructions right now. And um, I also have an information sheet about the tree improvement program. Um, but you can also look at our website or um, go to our Facebook page to learn a little bit more. And I'll note that on our Facebook page over the last several weeks, we have been featuring our master naturalists and citizen scientists who actually helped us collect acorns from last year. So that's been really fun for me to actually put a face with a, with a name. Um, so with that, I will um, turn it back over to Billy and Renee. And if anyone has any questions, um, please let me know. Great. Well, again, anybody type your questions in the chat pod if you do have questions. But Laura, one, one question I had is, is it, is it a problem if they just take, because I know they're in water, so if they just put them in a baggie, are they going to start getting nasty or do you have to actually dry them off and all of that or what, what's um, the best procedure to do? Well, after the float test, which is where you throw the ones that don't float and you pull, I, I usually recommend just drying them, just pat them dry with a um, paper towel. Mm -hmm. And um, if you, they do need to be kept in a, in a kind of a cool spot. Um, but, you know, they're designed to germinate and um, sometimes there'll be mold on the outside of the acorn, which won't make any difference for oh. growth. Um, so, yeah, but typically if you dry them off, it'll, it'll cut down a little bit on the, on the growth of mold and fungi. Okay, when you say you need a lot of acorns, how many is a lot? I mean, are you talking like millions of acorns? <laughs> or, or, over or, the, or, over or the what are you course, talking about? Like overall? Uh, well, over the, actually, that's a great question. So over the, can't do the math that quick in my head though. Um, <laughs> over the course, if we were able to get, so our goal ultimately is about 300 collections that go to phase two of the project, which is progeny testing. So last year we had 17,000 acorns and 91 from 91 trees. Of those, only 50 of those 91 seed sources actually produced enough acorns to mm -hmm. move to progeny testing. So about half of actually what came in. Um, now, part of that was because last year was a really poor mast year. And so some people were only able to get like a quarter of a bag. Um, but we're hoping this year is a better acorn production year. Um, so hopefully those bags will be full and the, the fuller those bags are, those one gallon bags are, the higher the probability they'll produce enough um, seedlings to move to the next phase. Okay. And we did have a question. Uh, what is the process required for germination they missed last week's show? Oh, okay. Well, so for um, white oak, it's sort of, they sort of auto germinate. <laughs> and so what'll happen is, um, white oak, the trees, um, the acorns actually mature on the tree. You actually can't pull them off green like you could an apple. It will not ripen. So those acorns have to drop by themselves off the tree. Um, so they have to turn brown. So sometimes the squirrels will be firing on the ground and they'll be green. You can't pick those up. You just pick up the brown ones that don't have any caps on. Anyway, so when they land on the ground, um, they will immediately start to grow a little root system. And that goes into the ground and then the <clears throat> the acorn actually overwinters that way um, because that gives that way when the spring rains come <clears throat> that acorn is ready to grow because the the root system is already in the ground ready to absorb that moisture and then the shoot will immediately start growing so typically um, the shoots will st start growing in um, early april okay and why white oak well, white oak is, um, we're having trouble with regeneration in the forest. So we have a lot of mature trees in the canopy. But when you look at the regeneration, <clears throat> the seedlings are not making it out of that seedling stage. There's a lot of shade. <clears throat> and so the white oak initiative, which was talked about on also on an earlier show from the woods today, they're doing a lot of treatments to try to figure out how can we open the forest up a little bit to provide enough light. Um, but the benefit of actually planting a seedling in those openings is it will already have an established root system. It's already, it's already growing. And I, and it, theoretically, right, with these fast growing, fast growth rate is one of the traits we're going to be selecting for. So if we can get really fast growing seedlings, it, they have a much higher probability of being able to outcompete the red maple and the tulip poplar and some of the other um, 
species that come in right away after a disturbance. So white oak is, is very valuable for um, wildlife, the acorns, um, but the wood is also very valuable for a variety of products. Um, around in Kentucky, of course, it's really, really important. That's what we put the bourbon in. Um, so the, all the bourbon barrels are made of white oak only. Um, and so, and they're harvesting at a pretty rapid rate. So we do need to make sure that we have seedlings moving into those bigger size classes um, so that we are making barrels in a sustainable way. Okay. Um, Wayne has asked um, if they collect from more than one, can they collect from more than one county location? And if so, do you need those new locations identified? Um, no, so what I do is you just let me know if you're collecting acorns and that kind of helps me keep track of, of who I need to be ready to send the postage and stuff to. Again, I will take as many as possible. So like last year, I got six collections from Shelby County, which is over by Memphis, Tennessee. And of those six collections, only two actually produced enough acorns. So, you know, we have plenty of room to grow seedlings um, in the nursery. So if, a, if someone wants to collect from more than one county, totally awesome. Um, you know, I try to keep my ask a little bit low. So that's why I say, you know, just collect from one tree for me. But if folks want to do it from um, different trees in different counties, that is totally great. The, the important thing is, though, is that the acorns that go in a single bag need to come from a single tree. So that's a really important piece. So, cause we don't want to mix the genetics up cause that's what we're trying to evaluate. So um, multiple counties are great. A lot, I have a lot of counties where I don't have any acorns from. So the more we can spread folks out, the better. Um, if you're, if someone wants to collect from more than one tree within a county, I ask that the trees be separated by about a quarter mile. Um, because that is um, the distance at which pollen will not be mixing between the two trees. And that way we'll get more genetic diversity represented in the program. Okay. Um, is there a deadline on when to send in the acorns? Well, typically um, they will start to grow. They'll actually germinate in those um, bags and that's okay. It's all right, you'll see the little white roots starting to come out. Um, we're hand planting them, so we won't generally, we can do that without damaging those new roots. Um, but typically people collect over, it takes about one to two weeks um, to fill that bag, depending on how, you know what, basically like the first acorns will start to drop, but then all of a sudden they, a whole bunch drop all at one time. And that is your best window of collecting the acorns. Cause number one, you can outcompete the squirrels and wildlife. Um, and those that are dropping all at once, those are the really good ones. Those are the ones that are mature and have the best probability of producing seedlings. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times, so you can collect over a one to two week window, just keep that bag in a cool sort of dark place. Um, and then basically as soon as that bag is full though, or getting full, you know, fire me off an email, I will send you that postage. And that way um, they can get to me as soon as possible. Once, once I get them at UK, we have a cold room. And so we'll put them in a cold room. And as soon as I get about 10 collections, I drive them out and we um, plant them in the nursery. So we want to get those, cause again, they're, they're already growing. So we want to get them in the ground as soon as we can. Okay, and we've had some questions about tree snap, and I know we have Dr. Ellen Crocker on here um, who can answer some questions about that. And um, so, Ellen, I don't know if you can pop on for us. Great, there. there you are. Yeah, definitely. So, tell so, us a little bit about tree snap. Yeah, tree snap is a free app. Um, you can use it for Android or iPhone. And uh, we've partnered with different researchers who are doing uh, citizen science projects like the one that Dr. Dewald just described today. Um, and so if you want to be collecting acorns, TreeSnap is just a really easy way to collect all of the data that she needs about them, um, as well as the GPS uh, location. Um, and you can just download the app, uh, answer a few questions, and then the number that it gives you associated with your entry, you can share with her or you can share her the link for that. Um, and that'll just make it a lot easier uh, to get her all of the information she needs down the road. So we're also partnering with other researchers on different projects. Um, uh, so uh, check us out at treesnap.org. Great, thank you, Ellen.
And we also have a question about how deep do you plant the acorns when you plant them? Okay. Well, so because white oak is um, designed to basically, it, it really is designed to lay on the surface of the soil. So you don't have to plant in the nursery. Um, we probably, the nursery goes through, they have a machine that digs furrows for us um, for when they're machine planting, but they go ahead and put the furrows in. The furrows are about um, maybe an inch deep. And then we just drop the acorns in and basically then cover the, the tops with the soil. So they are just really, they're just under the soil surface. You know, Laura, I was going to say, I really appreciate how you, it is a kid-friendly project, so the whole family can be engaged in this, you know, so I encourage all of our listeners, get out to your favorite beautiful white oak and your property or nearby and, um, and help out this collection and contribute um, to the Citizen Science Project. We're really trying to make a white oak as good as we can. So, Laura, thank you much on your efforts. You're welcome. It's I did have a couple other questions, too, that if there was a couple of trees that are close together, um, and they can't tell what acorn is coming from what. Um, should they collect the ones closer to the trunk or does that matter? It, well, you know, there's only so many things we can control. So yeah, they roll, you know, so um, generally, you know, they're gonna drop and roll. If there's a little bit of mixing um, between two adjacent trees, you know, what I would do is pick the nicest looking tree and collect acorns from underneath it. We may be getting some of the acorns from the adjacent tree, but to be perfectly honest, um, those two trees have been pollinating each other. So those genetically, those two trees, those acorns are related anyways from those two trees. So that's okay. That, that would be okay. All right. So I think that's all the questions we well, have. Yeah, right. That was great. Those were great questions. Thank you. Yeah, no, awesome. Good deal. All right. All right. Well, speaking of acorns, we have a um, another tree of the week that's going to feature a acorn producing tree. I don't know if Laurie can come on for a second. We're going to be talking about um, a, another type of white oak, right, Laurie? But not necessarily the white oak. Correct. Um, yeah, we're talking about post oak, um, which is one of our upland white oaks, and um, and it's also one that's included in the um, in the white oak uh, initiative that we're providing landowners information about because the wood has some of the same properties as Quercus alba, the white oak. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a great tree, a, an important wildlife tree, um, just like our white oak is and you know this time of year with the acorns and stuff out there. So yeah, here's post oak. I'm Laurie Thomas with the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources Extension and I'm here with the tree of the week, the post oak. Post oak. Quercus stellata is sometimes called iron oak. The species is known as post oak because early settlers used the wood for fence posts since it's so durable even when in contact with the soil. Post oak is recognized in the white oak group and the wood share many of the same qualities. And like most oaks, it's an important wildlife tree. It is a medium sized tree 40 to 50 feet in height and grows on average 12 to 24 inches in diameter. Post oak is abundant throughout the southeastern and south central United States. It typically grows on dry, rocky outcrops, ridges, and upper slopes, pretty poor sites. Post oak exhibits tremendous drought resistance. It's relatively slow growing and commonly overtopped by other trees, including other oaks, on better sites. However, on those poor sites, post oak tends to persist and can become dominant because it's more drought resistant than the other species it's growing with. It's classified as shade intolerant. Post oak is a deciduous tree with alternately arranged leaves, as you can see in the photo. The leaves are simple, which means they're made up of one blade. They're oblong in shape and about six to 10 inches long. The leaves typically have five lobes. The two middle lobes are squarish and nearly opposite, giving the leaf a cruciform or cross shape. This is a great characteristic in identifying this tree. The leaves tend to be thick and green above with scattered stellate hairs, and the underside is paler and typically pubescent or hairy. Post oak makes a lovely landscape or shade tree. From the spring, the, those red furry leaves to the thick green summer canopy and to the autumn with those colors of russets and browns, it could be a really nice addition to any landscape. Post oak is monoecious, which means one house and refers to the tree having both male and female flowers. 
The male flowers are yellow-green on hanging catkins, and the female flowers are typically reddish and are in a short spike in the leaf axle. The flowers bloom as the leaves are emerging from March to May, depending on location, and the flowers are wind-pollinated. The fruit is an acorn, and they are either solitary or paired, and they're on very short or sessile stalks. The acorns are typically one-half to two-third inches long and sort of egg-shaped. They have a warty, scaly cap that covers about one-third to one-half of the acorn. The acorns mature in one growing season, ripening in the fall, usually September through November. They germinate once they drop. Seed production begins around 25 years of age, give or take a little bit. And trees have good seed crops every two to three years. And post oak does not produce as many acorns as its associates white oak or black oak. And the acorns are dispersed by gravity and wildlife. Post oak is a valuable contributor to wildlife food and cover. The acorns provide high energy food during fall and winter and are considered important in the diet of wild turkey, white-tailed deer, squirrels, and many other rodents. When these acorns are available, the animals have lots of food to eat, so they're fattened quickly and they go through winter in good condition and are most likely to produce healthy young in the spring. The leaves are used for nest building by birds, squirrels, and raccoons, and the cavities in these trees provide nests and dens for various birds and mammals. The bark of post oak is ashy gray and initially quite scaly, but as the tree ages it becomes more blocky with ridges. Overall the bark looks pretty similar to white oak. The wood of post oak is light to medium brown in color, though there can be a fair amount of variation in that color. It has medium to large pores and is fairly um, coarse grained. Post oak has a very good resistance to decay, hence the name post oak being used for fence posts. Post oak falls into the white oak group and shares many of the same traits as white oak Quercus alba. The wood is used for cabinetry, furniture, interior trim, and flooring, a lot of the same things that white oak Quercus alba is used for. The wood is also used for railroad ties, construction timber, wood chips for smoking meats, and for fence posts. You remember where it gets its name from. And the bark is used for a decorative and protective mulch in landscaping. The national champion post oak is in Cherokee, Alabama. It's 255 inches in circumference, 95 feet tall with a 122 foot crown spread. If you'd like to know more about champion trees, check out American Forest Champion Tree Register or go to the Kentucky Division of Forestry Champion Trees. Now for a few fun facts about post oak. In The Natural History of Trees by Petey, he says post oak should be called cross-tie oak since some of the first rails of our railway system in America were laid upon post oak. Now, this may not actually be a fun fact, but the tannin in oak leaves, the buds, and the acorns are toxic to cattle, sheep, and goats, and that poisoning occurs more frequently in drought years when other forage is in short supply. The most dangerous season is during the spring and when the sprouting of that new foliage occurs somewhere between March and April. The species name of post oak, stellata, is Latin and means covered with stars in reference to the star-like tufts of hair on the leaves. I'm glad you joined me today to learn about post oak and hope you get the opportunity to get out into your woodland, local park, or neighborhood and enjoy this member of the white oak group. We greatly appreciate that uh, presentation and um, we do have one a uh, couple of questions and do most oaks contain the same toxins? Oaks do have they're heavy in tannins all of our oaks are they have a lot of tannins and that can be toxic to some I wouldn't necessarily mean it's a, to a toxin but it can be toxic to certain um, and especially livestock so yeah. Okay and how um, how much is it used, uh, post oak used in the Kentucky wood industry? Um, I'm, I don't know that I could actually answer that, but I think we might have Darren Morris or Eric Gracie who are on who might have a better feel for that as they worked with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. It's wood is lumped a lot of times with white oak. It has Quercus alba, a lot of the same properties, but I don't, from my experience with post oak, the growth form sometimes isn't as good. It's on a poorer site, um, so and it doesn't get quite as large. So maybe Darren can answer this for us. I see he's hopped on. Yeah, post oak is normally one that it's it's used for rough lumber, 
uh, railroad ties like you mentioned, but if there's a particularly good looking uh, post oak, um, it can be cut up and you can get uh, uh, number one grade lumber and, and, you know, high quality stuff from it. So it, you know, the individual tree will dictate uh, how high it goes in the market. Yeah, I think, Ari, at least a lot of my experience, it is a kind of a poor form um, tree than, you know, our, our top, typical white oaks. But, you know, one thing I really love about the post oak is so kind of tolerant of drought. You know, it can really perform well where some of our other oaks cannot. Right, and it's considered one of the most tolerant of drought of our oaks. So um, yeah, when you put them on that spectrum, so yeah. Okay. And I, I like post oak too, it's an easy one to identify. Those leaves are so unique that that cruciform or that cross shape. So yeah, it's a it's a good tree. Excellent. And I don't know, I, Matt's still on here and I was curious as to find out um, what's the difference in oaks with wildlife. Um, so I didn't know if Matt was still Matt, are you available? So probably one of the biggest uh, differences in, uh, for wildlife is the size of the acorn comes into play a lot. So what wildlife species are able to consume acorns uh, really comes down to can they fit it in their mouth and digest it. Uh, mm -hmm. So And that really plays a bigger role with our bird species. Uh, so things like quail will eat, be able to eat smaller acorns, but when you get into the larger ones, they won't be able to a lot of our songbirds are the same way. Um, things like blue jays are able to con consume a lot of acorns uh, up to about the medium size, but they just can't get over that hump there to get the big ones. Uh, <laughs> outside of that, it, it really comes down to numbers, how much uh, each tree produces, uh, and that can vary a lot within you know the species itself. So it's, it's size is probably the biggest component. Um, their nutritional quality is pretty consistent um, per gram. Let's say. Yeah, what about the toxins that we were talking about earlier? Well, uh, tannin level comes into play um, for sure. Uh, and, you know, tannins, I'm sure the forestry folks, if we had a tree physiologist here, they would probably be able to step in. That can vary quite a bit um, based on life history of the tree. Um, you know, if a tree as it's growing is browsed upon, uh, the area that is browsed upon, the reaction is an increase in tannins in that area to reduce the palatability. Uh, so you could have a variation within the branches of the tree based on its history of being consumed. So it, the higher the tannin level, the, bit, the more bitter it is. Okay, I was just going to ask, you know, in case some people don't know, can you kind of explain tannin and what, that, what that's about? So that's what makes your wine good if you're a red wine fan. <laughs> Um, so the tannins really, uh, it, it, to keep it as simple as possible, it, it changes the, the taste and, and digestibility and mostly the taste to uh, extremely bitter. So the higher concentration, it really becomes uh, almost, you know, where you're not going to want to consume it because of those levels. Okay. So will sheep avoid consuming acorns naturally? <laughs> I have yeah. no idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, where we have wild sheep, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we might have to transfer that question to animal sciences. Um, there you yeah. go. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right, I, folks. Uh, yeah. I don't know if there, it doesn't look like there's any more questions on there, but Lori, we greatly appreciate you doing our tree of the week every week. Yeah. Uh, we know it's not a small task and we ask you to do that every week and we greatly appreciate all the information that you've been gleaning, all the knowledge that you have on these trees. So we greatly appreciate you doing it. You're welcome. Yeah. Hey, and as a reminder, folks, those Laurie's building this big inventory of all these um, different trees of the week that uh, if you got interest in some of these past ones, we've been posting those as individual segments on our YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, check those out um, if you have interest, if you've missed any of those. Um, and again, all of our shows are being posted on fromthewoodstoday.com. Thanks to Renee and Brianna for all their work in doing that. Um, yeah. Well, speaking of From the Woods today, you know, um, next week we have an interesting show coming up too. We have an introduction of the forest industry um, and um, Dr. Matt Springer is going to start doing a wildlife sound. So you'd be, it'd be neat to hear about that. And then we have uh, a video on the econ contribution report. So um, a lot of different forestry, forest industry information next week. So um, that's a, another good one. Oh, we got another question for Matt that just popped in on food plots. 
and baiting them seems to be more prevalent now for hunting deer versus old school walking to find a sign, natural resources, that kind of thing. Is it necessary for wildlife management? You are entering the world of politics, which right now <laughs> do, uh, we have enough of that. Um, that wasn't my question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so it's a cultural um, thing in, in many ways in, in terms of that behavior and, and hunting style. Uh, I came from a state in Pennsylvania where baiting is completely illegal um, and, you know, feeding wildlife is illegal. And therefore, to me, when I left that state, you know, to a decade, a little more than a decade and a half ago, um, I got to states where baiting was legal and it, it seemed like cheating to me left and right because that's kind of the culture I grew up in. Um, it's much more prevalent in the South. Uh, especially on larger, you know, when you think about larger tracts of land, especially um, industrial forests, like pine production, uh, it's a lot harder to hunt those by following natural sign and, and you know, they don't have ridges and, and uh, funneling points as easily identifiable in those situations. So uh, people went to baiting and, and, you know, food plots is the other thing. It's, it's you know, um, you're getting into some very gray areas of wildlife management. Um, the way we approach them from a biologist side is, they're happening, and uh, as long as there's not drastic changes in um, how much they're occurring, uh, then we can, you know, basically know that our population harvests and those things are going to remain fairly consistent with that being a, a item that's out there. Um, and if a population harvest crashes for some reason, we wouldn't expect it to be because food plots and baiting stop. Um, so. It's, yeah, it's a very gray area and one that um, will fire a lot of people up. Uh, we've seen it with uh, CWD issues, um, chronic wasting disease is spread state to state into states that have baiting and they try to shut it down to slow the spread of the disease. And uh, people have resigned and been fired um, in agency positions because of it. Uh, so it can, it can very much motivate people in a both positive and negative fashion. Sounds like it. Yeah, right. uh, yeah, big subject there, Matthew. Big subject. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As a reminder, we are not attorneys, no, we <laughs> and, and we not. and we do not offer legal advice. So, uh, <laughs> yes. so the only thing I would say is, um, as long as you are following the laws that are in place from your game agency and your state uh, entity, then um, that's all we want. We you know we don't want people breaking the law. So if it's legal in your state. Um, just do it in the way that's uh, framed out to make it legal. All right, sounds good. So one thing I did want to share with them too is a picture that we actually ran in the Kentucky Woodlands Magazine. And if you can see this, this is um, them planting acorns at the nursery. And uh, you can see where they've done the lines and they're planting the acorns and going to cover them up with dirt. So people had a question about what it looked like. And I thought, well, we ran this in Kentucky Woodlands Magazine so we could easily show this. Oh so, yeah, that's yeah. a good addition. Hey, speaking good. of speaking of publications, Renee, if any of you all are um, Electric Co-op uh, members out there, Kentucky Living Magazine just did a huge spread on forestry here in Kentucky. So, and they actually featured the show um, from the woods today. So, if if you are a member or get your hands on that Kentucky Living um, recent issue, it's a it's a great information about forestry here in the state. So, definitely. All right, so I look like we've got another one in the book. So uh, yes, thank you, and, Billy, for joining me every week. I greatly appreciate all the help that you you do with the show. Oh yeah, uh, teamwork makes a dream work, and we're just glad to have all of our folks out there, you know, that are um, uh, tuning in with us each week and catching us on Facebook and watching the recordings. Again, we're doing this for you all, so please don't hesitate to let us know if there's some subject matter you'd like to see covered um, or what's going on in your neck of the woods, and um, we can maybe talk about that as well. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So like us on Facebook and, you know, share it and tell everybody about it. And um, if not uh, uh, this week, but we'll see you next week on Facebook Live or here at 11 o'clock on Wednesdays. Make sure to join us.